What happens when law, business, and life collide? Each week on Lead Council, your host Tom Tona will take a deep dive into topics related to the law, the business of law, and life. There will be insightful discussions with industry insiders, experts, and thought leaders making significant contributions and meaningful differences in their fields of expertise. Tom is the founder and managing attorney at Tona Law. He has been a practicing attorney since 1994 and the leader of Tona Law since it opened in 2001. The goal of this podcast is to provide you with free information on law and the business of law and to give you actionable tools related to each of these areas. Now, here's Tom. All right. Welcome back to the Lead Council Podcast. This is your host, Tom Tone. I'm here with Juliet. Jules, what's going on? Hello. Jules, we have somebody I've been trying to get on the podcast for a while, mm-hmm. and she's a very good friend of mine, powerhouse attorney out in California, Sue Ann Van Dermiden. She is an attorney. She is the founding and senior partner of Van Dermiden Macus Law Corporation and the managing partner of VM in the San Diego office. Sue Ann, I'm going to go into your background, but I want to say hello first. How are you, my friend? Oh, hello. It is so fabulous to be with you again. And for all the listeners, I call them Tona. Tona and I used to hang out together at least four times a year at an organization association where we met. And it is so great to be with you again. You were always such an inspiration and such a fun friend to me. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I am, I'm super excited that I could get you on here for multiple reasons. I'm going to explain it this way. So first of all, I'm just going to tell people what you do really quick. You began as an employment litigator in 1993. And since 2006, you've built a practice that focuses on conducting workplace Title IX investigations, which is a really niche area of law. And I'll have you explain that, what it is, because most people like myself, you know, probably need to hear that. But you're also an expert witness on employment matters and conducting interactive training seminars. You're an educator now, which I didn't know you're a professor at McGeorge School of Law, which is awesome. And you built a separate business, the T9 Mastered, which focuses on educating Title IX sexual assault in investigators. So your firm is now one of the largest law firms providing neutral workplace and campus investigation services in the U.S. So welcome to the show. You are a powerhouse, and I am so excited to have you here. (laughs) Yes, Thank you. It's funny when you say that. I like that person. I want to know her. It does not feel like who I am, but I, I, I love that. And you're absolutely right. We have a very, very unique practice, and I can't believe, I think this year marks something like whatever, 30 plus years as a lawyer. Here we are. Wow. Right? Can you believe it? So I tell so many people about you and Deb, who I'm also hoping to have on the show, and Deb Maddox, who's another powerhouse player, right? So Juliet, I'll tell you the story really quick. So we're in this Atticus group called Dominate Your Market, which they aptly named to appeal to all the egomaniac male attorneys that are in the room. (laughs) And then... There are these two quiet ladies sitting in the room, Sue Ann and her partner at the time, Deb, who's since retired, I think. She is she fully retired at this point? Uh, put a footnote on that. I won't interrupt your story, but we'll come back to whether Deb's fully Okay. Re- okay. So they're <laughs> sitting in a room full of, you know, pretty high achieving male attorneys. Mm-hmm. And they're doing what I like to call talking shit, right? It's all testosterone and it's all this many millions of dollars, etc. And then I get to know Sue Ann and Deb and I'm like, oh my God, they're like the biggest players in the room. They are legit the biggest players of this room. And so I said that to them one night. I think we were at the bar and we were having wine and club sodas and whatnot. And I have never seen two more humble people who have achieved such great things. One of the things I will give you credit for, Sue Ann, is you guys forced me really to take a hard look at what the power of female leadership could look like. So I want to thank you for that. My whole leadership team is female, except for me. And there's seven of us on there, including my managing attorney who's a female, Jules who heads up marketing, my HR person, et cetera. Entire leadership team, female. And I will tell you that they're awesome at it because they, they bring egoless leadership to my practice. And that's what I need. 
And so you are a big reason why I purposely and intentionally looked at that type of leadership. So thank you for that. Well, I'm honored. It's interesting you say that too. I was on a podcast yesterday for the American Bar Association and it was Women Empowering Women. And it was a panel of these amazing women from across the country and we had the same exact discussion. So it's really timely. And and I want to sort of set the tone for it in in terms of I want to be careful about stereotypes because I think yes men can be fabulous leaders and so as we talk about this I don't I don't want to discount any of that or fall into some of the stereotypes and at the same time I do think there are different challenges that female attorneys bring female leaders bring and different maybe obstacles that we face too so just to kind of set the stage for where we're going. 100%, and I think that disclaimer is valid. Some of the most caring leaders that I know are men and they're very nurturing and and have become very good friends of mine, right? So Mm -hmm. let's dive right in. Why don't you tell me some of those challenges that female attorneys or female leaders or female attorney leaders would face in a very traditionally male-dominated field? So that's, that's actually really interesting. And maybe I would say this, that there, there's just a lot, a lot of pressures on attorneys in general, right? It's a, it's a highly competitive, contentious, adversarial world as a starting point. And then you add maybe all the kinds of layers to it. And, you know, gender can be one of them. Certainly as you're a junior female lawyer in the industry, You can add that layer on, and and there's all these pressures that layer onto it then too. You have to be a really good lawyer. You have to be a really good mother. You have to be a really good partner. And meanwhile, you have to be witty and fun and smart and, and pretty and have healthy relationships. So there's just so much pressure that goes into it. And it may not be super unique to women, but what I have found, I honestly believe that the way you get through it is you is you surround yourselves. And I know we talked about this in Dominate Your Market with a rope team. And I think you may have even coined that, you know, Tona. And we could not do this without other females. And so part of it is, I we talked about this yesterday in our podcast, where you have to show up confidently. You have to show up confident to your clients in a deposition, in the courtroom, to your partners. But then thank goodness you can run off and have your little rope team where you can be vulnerable and real and talk and commiserate about issues because real life issues can happen. You can you can miss a deadline and you need to be able to commiserate about that and problem solve it. And guess what? You're not the first person that's missed a deadline. So be able to commiserate about that and yet show up confidently to the client and to the judge to talk about the missed deadline. You can also have problems that you create yourself. You can send an email to Juliet and Juliet doesn't respond to me for four hours. And oh my God, Juliet must be mad about mad at me about something. And what did I do? And she's going to tell all of my friends and they're going to talk to me. And you realize you've created a problem that doesn't even exist because Juliet was just on a podcast for the last four hours and that's why she didn't respond. And then you can have other problems that are very personal and not professional. You can have a sick child or whatever. So all of those things happen in life at the same time you have this professional life you're trying to build and so to have a rope team that you can go commiserate with and be vulnerable with, with that can help you solve problems and hold you accountable is incredibly important. Yeah, I agree. So the concept of the rope team you're referring to, I wish it was me that came up with it. We were at a, the Atticus Summit and there was a singer who was on American Idol who they brought in as a guest to speak. What was her name? Do you remember her name? I would love to give her credit. I took a photo with her. I can't think of her name now. She was fantastic. And actually, she lost her hearing but still became famous. Jules, do you know her name? No. I don't. All right. <laughs> anyway, she talked about the concept of a rope team. And that was brought up by a person who climbed Mount Everest. And they said, hey, guess what? You ain't getting to the top without a rope team. And basically, a rope team is people you tie yourself to to band together to support each other. And that that's what Sue Ann is referring to. So... Mm-hmm. I think it, while we are, we issued, we issued our disclaimer on the whole gender thing. There are unique challenges for females that I'm very conscious of because I'm surrounded by working moms. My wife is a working mom. I have a ton of working moms here. And I say every day, I'm like, I don't know how any of you do it. Mother's Day comes. I'm wishing everybody happy Mother's Day. I buy them flowers. I buy them dinner. Like... I don't know how anybody strikes a balance. Like, 
I'm on a, I'm only able to do one thing and that's work. And that's horrible to say, but like, I just can't do the other stuff. I don't know how to run a business and run a family. My wife does shoulder a lot of that, right? So it does seem like an inordinate amount of pressure. I try every day to do better, right? But I think that's very unique. My wife was giving me a statistic last night that women pick up 86% of the household burden, even though they work the same amount of time as men. Is, is, does that statistic sound right, Sue Ann? You're smiling. So. It, it resonates. It resonates. I, it's an interesting thing because I will tell you, I mean, now my kids are grown and have their own lives and they're about, both of them are engaged about to be married uh, in their Congrats, 20s. Congrats, by the way. Thank you. And it, it feels, it feels it, Fabulous to have adult daughters. I love that space. I will tell you, I don't feel, as I look back, actually, you should have my daughters on your podcast and ask them these questions. But as I look back, I don't feel like I was a perfectly balanced mother lawyer person. I, I always felt like I was not quite good in any of the areas that you should be as a, as a mother, as then a spouse, as a friend, as a lawyer because you're, you're constantly balancing those, not balancing, because you're not balancing, you're constantly trying to figure out how those competing interests fill your time. And mm-hmm. in some parts, you just, you do the best you can and you survive. I, and I know that's what women bond together about, like, how do I balance this? How do I give my kids everything they need and still be, you know, climb the steps in my career? And it's, it's extraordinarily difficult. And I think my daughters will tell you that they saw me work really hard and they sometimes felt like I was absent. And I, I think they turned out fantastic and they're now figuring out those same questions for themselves. What's important to me? Can I have it all? Can I have a family and a career? And it's not perfect. You just have to sacrifice it. And I know that I worked way more hours than um, a lot of mothers would recommend. A hundred percent. And I I think, sorry, Jules, I'll let you you ask in a second, but Mm -hmm. I will tell you that I think that's actually part of the entrepreneurial human equation because we only have so many hours in a day and we only have so many percentage points. So let's call it a hundred units of Sue Ann you can give to something, right? There's not 110. So every percentage point of Sue Ann that goes into building this mega law firm is at the trade-off of something else that sh- could or should in your mind get that attention. And, and I know this because I, I suffer from the same thing. You know, like if I'm researching a way to expand into a certain thing, I'm not present for my daughter. And I, and I will often, and I hate this, but she's, she's old enough. She's 13 now. So she's on the phone all the time. But the minute she picks up that phone, it's my permission slip to start working on the business in my head. I could be sitting there staring at a TV screen, but I'm game planning. And then I go, I just took percentage points away. Right. And I feel guilt. The guilt is overwhelming. So, but I can imagine it's even more difficult for women, right? It's even more difficult. And that was actually one of the first questions that we had come up with for you because having a balance, some people will tell you as an entrepreneur, there is no work-life balance. So I was interested to see if you had one or if you even believe there is a work-life balance when you make your whole life your work. Such a great question, Juliet. Here's the one perhaps practical tip that I can give. The one thing that I found I was able to do is because you're working so much that when you're not working, you feel like you need to spend all your time with your kids. I sort of got to a point in my life where I crave friends. I love people. It's part of why I do what I do in my work. And we can talk about that in a minute. But one of the things that has really helped is marrying your professional life with your personal life in any way you can. So for example, as part of my work, one of the big things, of course, is marketing. You have to market, develop networks and build business and relationships. And the way that I was able to do that and maximize my units is to 
create relationships and a network and bonds with other attorneys. I travel a tremendous amount to conferences. I speak at conferences and the American Bar Association, the Association of Workplace Investigators, the National Association, the colleges and universities, and the list goes on. And because I travel and speak so much and that builds my business, I have formed and developed relationships with attorneys across the country who are now my best friends. And so I get to travel with my best friends. So I've been able to marry interests. And I tell my team that too, as new lawyers are coming up is build your marketing plan around your interests. So if you love animals, maybe you need to get on the board of directors of an animal rescue unit. If you love real estate, for example, maybe you get on a board with some sort of a, a real estate or if you're a parent teacher, you know, organization in your schools, build and marry your interests as much as you can between personal and professional. And that that's the one good tip that I have figured out and can give other people. But I, it's such an age old issue about how you find work life balance. And I know that there's a generation coming up, and again, I don't want to stereotype, but there's a generation coming up that is way more important for them to have work-life balance than it is to like climb the ladder. And, and that's not my story. It was important to me. I came from North Dakota. It was a very, you know, kind of a poor farm childhood. And it was important for me to be able to build a business and so I was more interested in building that business than work-life balance. So I hope that one tip at least gives you hope, but I'm not sure that I was super balanced. It does, but it does also answer a lot of things that I don't even know if you're aware of. I go to this mastermind and they do it a little bit different than some of the other groups I've been to where they do a hot seat and they're like, what's your struggle, right? So they, they ask you a couple of questions. They say, what's your struggle? What are you trying to solve? And the guy facilitating, it was a brilliant guy out of Florida. And he gets to me, I'm last. He says, what's your struggle? And I'm like, entrepreneurial isolation, right? Because, so we started doing EOS. And I, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but the higher up you go in what you're building, the more isolating it is for the builder, Right. Did you did you experience that with your practice? How many people are you up to now? I know you had like 60 people, 70 people at one point. So I don't know how big you are or whatever. Yeah, no, no, no. We I think we peak, we're at our peak perhaps right now. We're some close to over 50 people, 35 ish okay. lawyers. No, no, no. You're and you're okay. absolutely right. And wow. and I think the other shift is if you know, as you build, become more isolated for sure. And you also shift from being a lawyer, which you spend all your life trying to be the best lawyer you can be. And all of a sudden you're shifting from a lawyer to a boss, to an entrepreneur, to a marketer, to an op operations person. So all of those things happen, but you're right. You're, you're at a different space in terms of your collegiality when you are building the business and you are the boss. And that you're absolutely, you know, you're right. You need to then find your colleagues elsewhere that can support you that are also. That's it, yeah. Yes. Why I said you gave us answers, I wasn't even sure you gave us, but the, the uh, Jules, so you know, like the suicide rate among lawyers is high. Depression, anxiety, substance abuse, you know, and connection is the only answer. And what, that's what you're talking about, right, Sue Ann? Like, I realized the minute as I was talking about fears and, and fe how fear drives us as entrepreneurs, right? And then this isolation thing that creeps in and we're up to 40 people now, right? And it's very isolating. And as, as a man, we tend to be really isolating to begin with, right? I was joking around with Jules. We went out to lunch with somebody else in the office and I'm like, guys don't talk about feelings. I'm not going to go home and talk to my wife and be like, I feel so lonely. She's going to be like, what? What are you talking mm -hmm. about? I think she will, but she's not because she relates better as a female. She's really good at relating with me on an emotional level that I don't know I even have the bandwidth or capacity for. But you gave us the answer to all of that stuff. If anybody's listening to this, entrepreneurial isolation is real. And the only answer is connection. And you said building your rope team, right? Like I consider you and Deb part of my rope team. I'm like, if I ever had a crisis or an emergency, I would fly you guys out from California to talk to me. You know, like I would get you on a plane if I needed to, you know, and I know you would for me and I would do that for you. Right. So, 100%. yep. and then it lifts you out of that dark place as a lawyers have a very dark place that we go to, especially when you're leading. 
And, I, and it's very common. You're laughing, but it's very common. It comes up a lot lately in these masterminds I'm attending. And, and the only answer is connection building those connections. Absolutely. And deliberately building meaningful relationships, right? And, and working at them, working yes, at them. Yes. And in some cases rare, because I love people and you can give grace to people who aren't like the perfect sort of rope team or, you know, friend, but at some point to excising those people that aren't healthy for you, you know, cutting them out too. You were talking about building those connections, but then you're also a mother and you're also a business owner, successful entrepreneur. So I guess my question is, how do you go about distributing your time evenly and then still leaving time for yourself and not exhausting yourself? I feel like I'm always tired and always trying to find the energy to continue showing up. And, you know, after a full work day, it's like, how do you even have the energy to give to other people and then much less give to yourself? So where do you find the energy? <laughs> yeah, no, and it's a, you know, it's a great, great question, Julia. I mean, part of it, if, if you were to say, tell me what's important to you. I would watch your life over a period of time, whatever that is, a week, a month. And I can tell what's important to you by what you actually do, right? Because you prioritize what's important to you. You just do. And even when you have all these competing interests, you tend to gravitate to what's important to you. And I'm setting aside that sort of paralysis that can occur because sometimes you can just curl up in a ball and not do anything, which I'm not talking about that. But so for me... When I was really in the heart, the crunch of it all, because now I'm past it and that I don't have really right now I have me and my business and whatever I choose to add to it. But when you are a mother with young children and building a business and they all collide at the same time, you can tell what's important. I would get up, I would literally get up every morning between 4.30 and 5.30 in the morning and go work out. It was the only time I could work out. Once I was ready to go, it wouldn't happen again. And then once you get back, you, you give it to your kids because you have to, you have to get them up, you know, breakfast and lunch and out the door into school. And then you're off to work Then you come home and you carve out time for them for a period of time, whether it's soccer practice or driving them to horse lessons. And then at some point in the evening, you go back to work and you work for a period of time and you just have to bear down for a period of time, time and do that. Uh, but every phase of life is different. And then the kids get into high school. And so there's different sort of challenge at that point. And that's when it became important to me to, to marry my professional life with my personal life in terms of friends, because I didn't have extra time to have a girl's weekend or to go out with the girls at night. And I say girls loosely because I, I refer to them as, I guess, females, but, but it does change at some point. It kind of when the kids get older. So I'm not sure that's a perfect answer, but you definitely will carve out time for what's important to you. And if you're not healthy as part of that process, you can't do all the rest of the stuff. And I know, Tona, you, I know you are driven and super healthy. That part of your life has been an important to, I think, your success because you're not strong mentally. And maybe, Juliet, that is the other piece of advice I would give to younger people coming up is just to stay really strong mentally, which I think requires strong physical health as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's excellent, excellent advice. As always, I, I think that, again, just unpacking a lot of what you said, first of all, Jules, I can tell you that just from my perspective, and it's going to be different because I'm a man, but there is no equal division of time. There just mm -hmm. isn't. It's like being in a relationship where they're like, it should be 50-50. Yeah, tell that to my wife because sometimes it's 95-5. And sometimes like when my dad passed away, it was 95-5 for two years. I was a mess. It wasn't until two years that I snapped out of it and I started again. And then she pushed me. She pushed me at about the year and a half mark. She's like, look, I get it, but you got you to gotta come back. You got to mentally come back. You got to re-engage. And the fallacy of equal parts, equal division, work-life balance, or relationship, 50-50 is a fallacy. It's not, right, Sue Ann? I mean, am I saying anything that, that you know, is, is off in your mind? I mean, you've been around. You know what I'm saying. 
Yes, I do know what you're saying. And, and I think, but I also don't think it's healthy to keep score, really. I, I Unbelievable. Mean, That's yeah. such good advice. Yeah. If you do what you do because you love what you do, because it's required, because of all the things. And if, if you start to like, well, you have to, you know, 50 percent of the time walk the dog and take the kids to school and all those things. It's just that I, I, we don't have time for that. We just all buck up and do the best we can and and support each other. I think that's where I land. Yeah, I'm with you. And like you said, you give time to the things that are important to you. I know Tom says that all the time. And he's constantly drilling that into my head and those around him. Like, if it's important to you, you'll find the time for it. Yeah, yeah what Sue Ann said is 100% on. And she's, mm-hmm. you're really smart, Sue Ann. You're so smart. You, I know. She said, you know, she said, <laughs> she show me where you spend your time. And I would say one more thing to add to that. Show me where you spend your time and where you spend your money. And I'll tell you where your priorities are. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then follow those priorities as long as you realize they're going to a place because you're getting some kind of ROI return on investment from that focus, whether it's intentional or unintentional, right? Like it, Jules, you're very driven professionally. And so, yeah, there's going to be an ROI for that. You work really hard on it. So that's, mm-hmm. that's a lot of astute observation. Thanks, Sue Ann. So, I am so yeah. lucky. Like when I was building out my leadership team under this EOS thing, I went out to my coach. I said, look, I have these two very young professionals that are super hungry and really competent. Like I've had people significantly more experienced or, or with years more on each of them, but quite honestly, they're better, right? So he was like, well, look, not every leader, you don't have to hire C-suite people. You can build them. You can build them. And that's what I'm kind of doing with Jules and with Alicia, who's the HR person, because they're years ahead then their age belies, right? In terms of their skill set, their maturity, all of that stuff. So that's why I chose the same thing you did. I love people and I'm willing to invest in people as long as they show me they kind of have what it takes and, and are willing to invest in themselves. So here's, okay, here's, a, thank you for sharing that, Tona. Here's what I would say to the Juliets of the world, because, I mean, you talked about me at the beginning and powerhouse attorney and all those things. And that's just honestly not how I feel. I mean, you're just, you just always feel humble and you never want to rest on what happened yesterday. And you're constantly in this state of questioning and how can I be better and doubt and all those things. So here's the one thing that I spend time teaching my team. And I would tell people, which is we have to show up in this way. That's confident. Um, We talked about that earlier. But the reality is you have all these things happening behind the scenes that you, you have your rope team for. There's this book called The Credibility Code. And I'm, I will tell you, because I read so much for my work, I don't read a lot of books. So if I'm recommending a book, you can pay attention to it. But The Credibility Code really talks about all the verbal and nonverbal things that you can do to show up as confidently. And it's not just a book. It is a very practical exercise of things that you can you can practice and it's just so helpful in terms of how do you present and how you show up and how you can start thinking but at the same time still being a vulnerable real person to your rope team and having them there to support you so i just think that's a a key to kind of success is you especially as a younger person when you are showing up and you're you walk into a room of giants people that are better than you, because that's what you want to surround yourself with is people that are better than you. They'll make you better. But how do you show up confidently in that space and at the same time be real? That is, Mm -hmm. Jules, did you write that stuff down, Jules? Oh, I'm ordering that book (laughs) as soon as we're done. (laughs) So so that is really, really solid, solid advice. One of the statistics, you know, I like my numbers and stuff, but I read a statistic as I was building my leadership team that if you put a hundred men in a room 85% 85% will overestimate their ability and apply for jobs they have no business applying for. And conversely, 100 females in a room, 85% are qualified and will not apply for the same position that they should be applying for. Wow. And that statistic was eye-opening to me because I'm surrounded. In, I'm blessed. I'm surrounded by a team that is super talented super loyal, 
super humble, the humility. But by the same time, they are all empowered to tell me like it is. Janira, who's my right hand and been my right hand forever, she's empowered to overrule me at this point. She gets the final say if there's a dispute between me and her as far as the business. In her role as the integrator of the firm, she's my second-in-command COO type. And so that is fantastic advice because I see that a lot, Sue Ann, in the, the ladies that work with me, the females that work with me, that they're fantastically skilled and doubtful of themselves at every step. Mm-hmm. And it makes me nuts because that's above my pay grade, right? Like, I can't do anything about that other than to keep empowering them, keep giving them the authority, you know, and just, again, like you said, keep showing up in that support role that I can provide, right? So, And we've discussed confidence a lot in this episode so far. And I recognize that confidence is a huge part of showing up in your job. And like you said, as lawyers, but how, when you show up in a room of, like Tom said in the beginning, of all those men who have all these big egos, how do you balance showing up and giving that confidence, but also having that self-doubt? I mean, I don't know if you've, I'm assuming, but I feel like everybody experiences self-doubt at some point, especially as a young professional. So how did you manage that self-doubt and also showing up with confidence? Yeah, and I, I do think that is where you choose your audience, right? I mean, if you're showing up in a, in a court hearing or in a, a room and you're the presenter, whatever it might be, or maybe you're, you're just showing up and mingling with other people, showing up confidently there but having the rope team, so for example, um, I mentor a lot of young lawyers. And so if I invite them to an event of 300 lawyers, I will go with them and we will have a meeting place and I'll send them off, go meet, you wanna meet these three people, go do it, ask them really good questions. And when you're done, come back to me as like a safety zone. So I think that's the same idea is you need to show up with the right audience with confidence, but then you have need to have your people over here that you can be real and vulnerable with on the side. Uh, and, I, and I think that is the other thing. I, I also think, I don't want to think about our self-doubts, if that's what we want to call it, as negative, because I think it's what drives us to continue to be better. And I think the confidence piece is on a given subject, and we have a very unique niche in the terms of, in terms of what we practice. And I know that in any given room, I probably know as much, if not more, than anybody else on that very narrow topic. So I can be completely confident in that slice of my life, even if there's other pieces that I may know less about and somebody else is you know, the expert. So part of it is just knowing what you know Part of it is showing up confidently, even if that's not what you're feeling, but you show it because that's what you need to do for this audience. And then part of it is having this group over here that supports you that you can be real and vulnerable with. Yeah, that that's yeah. that's really, really solid feedback. Talk about the niche you have, because I was fascinated by it. Explain the Title IX work that you do and, and it just explain what your firm does. Yes. So, I mean, if you start sort of at a high level, people understand I, I'm an employment lawyer. So if somebody needs to sue for race discrimination or sexual orientation harassment or retaliation you have a plaintiff's lawyer for that and then you have a defense lawyer that defends the company who's being sued or the individual that's being sued my practice now i was a defense employment lawyer my practice now focuses on neutral workplace investigations or campus sexual assault investigations how did you stumble upon this niche i mean you started out doing employment defense but you guys ended up dominating a space that it was like pure blue ocean from the way you've described it to me in the past, meaning there weren't a lot of people doing it. And then you came together with Deb. So, so how did you develop into from two lawyers to 50 lawyers? Maybe that's the other sort of thing that, so I'm pretty humble, but one of my gifts, I guess, is that I'm super curious and fascinated and I see and sees. I'm always looking for opportunities and this was one of them. There was a whole collision of things that were happening around the time. You had 
you know, the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings, you had a couple court cases that came out. Suddenly employers had an obligation to conduct investigations in a certain area under you know, sexual harassment, which then became expanded. And now we do investigations on almost anything, including like bullying. And so I think seeing opportunities and then seizing them and Deb and I, which many of us have just many people including ourselves describe ourselves so we're like one plus one equals 18 together we're just <laughs> well really we just we get together and our minds are just like we just can do things that we can never do alone but we both started this practice separately and then we came together and we saw all these opportunities and we saw ways that we could help clients and employers and campuses and students and and we just build up, we built on it. And I still, that I feel like that's still kind of my mantra is like, what's the next opportunity? How can I help clients more? And looking for changes in the law that can build upon that. So that's really what it was. So like we, I saw this opportunity and I just grabbed it. Yeah, and that, listen, that's why I call you a powerhouse because you, you are a brilliant business person. And I, I've kind of have seen up close, you know, one-on-one conversations with you and Deb, what you have found and seized upon. I love that saying, see it and seize it because those types of opportunities are fleeting too, right? Any, so you might have what you described as self-doubt, even as a young attorney, when this presented in front of you, but the fact that you were courageous enough, both you and Deb, to see it and seize it and take action is just, it's incredible what you've done, what you've built, the reputation, the, the, you know, the PR news presence that you have. And it's not smoke and mirrors. You're delivering, right? You deliver the goods. You've got major institutions hiring you for these types of specialized niche investigations. So that's why I wanted you to come on. I wanted Jules and and my female contingent of listeners to hear how it's done. And the and the the men that are 20 years behind me to see what a player looks like and and to redefine what it looks like cuz you are a major baller in my mind <laughs> and you know again that that's why I was excited to have you on so I appreciate that you and deb sound like the definition of a power team <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> more than that would actually really fun so i think that's part um so i have one other comment and then i have a question for for yeah. either of you so the other thing that i really have lived by And I think it's important both in my work, but also just in life. And it it sounds sort of cliche, but I I tell you, it is, there's so much truth to it. And and that is turn your frustrations into fascinations. And it just, it, it really helps to like approach so many things with that, whether it's a relationship or a problem and just be fascinated by it because that makes you curious and stays out of judgment. And it also helps that frustration and that feeling of loss of control. And so that's been really helpful. And I'm, I'm certainly not perfect at that, but it does help. So that's the other kind of tip I would leave you with. But I, like, Juliet, you and I are going to get to know each other separately, so I can pose a question to you. But mm-hmm. Tona, I've, I've you know, watched you for years and years and years, and you have been, I think, you show up in the most confident way ever and you've built this amazing business and you have tremendous relationships. Um, but I know also know you've had a couple knocks along the way. So I'd yeah, love yeah, to yeah. know like when, when you're in the knock mode, when you've been just knocked down and, and it seems sort of insurmountable and it feels bad and you're like, I've worked so hard and then I'm just kind of at a low. How do you, how do you dig your way out of that? That's an awesome question. So yeah, I have taken some very significant knocks and I, you know, I I think back to one of my bigger entrepreneurial hits where in my early thirties, I thought I was invincible. Everything I touched turned to gold. I enter into a a deal that was an international business dealing. It was at a time that the internet was closing the world. They didn't really need this service. It was an import export type of thing. And I lost multiple seven figures that by the time 35, I had amassed and I was in a really dark place. And if I had to chalk it up to one thing for myself, it's no matter how hard I've ever gotten hit, I get up the next day. 
right? And I'm talking dark place. Like at one point questioning, is there any tomorrow for me, right? Like that dark of a place and then getting up and doing it anyway. Getting up, suiting up and showing up just the way you said, confident or not, getting in the room and putting your hands to work. The one thing for me is I never really had an emotional attachment to money because I think back to when I was happiest in life and I had nothing. So I was like, okay, so I lost money. I can make it back. I'm, what I am confident in is my skill set. So if tomorrow I was to start at negative 200,000, I will make it back. It's just green paper to me. And it's a scorekeeping thing. So, okay, I lost today. Tomorrow I'm going to get up, suit up, and play again. And my skill set is what I'm really confident in. And so let's talk about that. Let's shift for a second because you talked about shifting your skill set from lawyer to leader, right? And I think you are a true leader, right? Like you're a leader where, again, if I think about who I've known over the years, you and Deb taught me the difference between a boss and a leader. And I think I am a finally understood what that was. Now I'm a leader. I don't think I was when I knew you. I think I was more of a boss or I was a manager, but now I lead, but I watched, I had the benefit of watching up close what true leadership is, the way you and Deb showed up, the way you would explain to me what your leadership style was. So while law school teaches us how to be business people, it definitely didn't teach us, I'm sorry, it teaches us how to be lawyers. It doesn't teach us how to be business people. So. Why don't you tell us your transition from lawyer to leader? And so as I say this, I fear that my team might watch this. <laughs> so, have no fear. Have no fear. <laughs> I do. Honestly, here's, here's the thing that I have learned. I, I'm not sure I'm the best leader, but what I've learned is to lean on the team to ask them questions, to get their buy-in. And it's not, it's not coming, you know, here's the message from on high. It's really creating a conversation with the people that you're leading and getting their buy-in intake. It has been pretty sh like a major shift when we brought on, call it what you want, a task force, an executive committee, a partner team, whatever it is to consult with. Because we, you know, we have a very narrow lens based upon our life's experience and where we sit. And, you know, we have a picture, the, the big picture of the finances and where we're going and the strategic plan and the little, we have a picture that not everybody else has, but they have a whole picture that we don't have. And so we have really learned to consult and do surveys and have task forces and ask questions and get buy-in. And that has, that's kind of been a game changer. I think, you know, the way my experience is so limited, I can't, I can't leave the team through my experience alone. Also, here's the other thing. This is my genius was I chose Deb as a partner who's exceptional, exceptionally good at things I'm not good at. And the same is true with my current partner. He's, he's, he's a Deb in another you know, body. <laughs> he has right, the same right. skills and experience that she does that I, I, I'm just, I can't be good at everything. I'm not an operations person. I'm not a finance person. I'm not going to talk to the tax accountant. If you want me to go build a whole new network and you want me to market and you want me to bring in 15 more clients in a day, I can do that. I can do quality control. I can think about how you write reports and how you um, give the best delivery to clients, but I'm not good at the book. So surrounding yourself with people that are really good at what you're not good at is also helpful. And that's the other thing that I think has been super helpful is I have had a, a co-leader that's exceptional at things I'm not good at. Yeah, I, I, again, knowing Deb and seeing the way you guys complemented each other and the strengths that you each bring to the table, that is the secret sauce. And then you found your new partner who basically was the same type of relationship. It's funny because Deb turned me on to a, a gentleman who I just had on the podcast, Dan Feynman, right? I said to Deb, oh, yes. this is what I'm looking for. He's and I've been with Dan now for 18 months. Dan's been my fractional CFO, yes. right? Yes. And, you know, I, I've always 
when I look for answers, I go to you, I go to Deb, I go to Craig, my rope team, right? The people that I'm like, you've already paved the path for me to where I'm looking to go. And I trust you. I trust like, so I, I'm good tying my rope to you and Deb and Herb and, and, and all of these people that I met through this one mastermind group at Atticus, right? So I take issue with the fact that you don't characterize yourself as a strong leader because I have studied you and Deb from afar and near. And I realized what I was missing when I was at the head without the skills I have now, which was exactly what you're talking about. Actively listening to the people that you bring in, surveying them, letting them fill you in on their fact information and their experience and their worldview of exactly the same scenarios that we're wake up so convinced of every day and asking myself, what if I'm wrong? What if they're right? And I've just, I don't know, I've become way more humble in my approach to all of it. And again, I, a lot of that is because of the three ladies in the room or the four, there was a bunch of ladies in the room that were powerhouse players were very quiet. Uh, Fiona Van Dyke, who's my estate's attorney and who I talk to once a month, right out of New Jersey. She's quiet, never said a word. You got all these testosterone guys running around, millions of this, millions of that. And Fiona is dominating the estate market in New Jersey, right? And that's when it, kind of dawned on me like, hey, there's something to this leadership thing that they're doing that I'm, I'm not seeing in a lot of male leads that I know. So don't be that humble because you, you've got it going on, my friend. You've got it going on. So well, and I'm, that's I'm, why I'm I hang really... out with the Tonys of the world because they, they build you up for sure. <laughs> Listen, but, but you know me and Jules knows me very well. I don't heap false praise on anybody. Like I, I was so excited to have you come on and so excited that Deb said they'd come on. And, and, you know, I, I, I'm already thinking of a title for this, like, you know, the powerhouse women of law. Cause that's how I feel about you, my friend. Like you, you are doing special things. Even the work you do, by the way, it's, it's mission and vision driven to make the world a better place. And that's special. That's special, right? So kudos to you. Kudos to you. Thank I you. Ask, I ask every guest this. You're welcome. I ask every guest this one question before I wrap it up. And I appreciate you giving me all your time. What do you think has been one of your biggest needle movers in your professional life? Probably... It's tied to relationships, but it's probably becoming a little bit famous at what you do. And there, you know, everybody has a certain skill, it's something that they can give that they're a little bit that they're expert at. And because I love people, I have tried to really become a little bit famous by speaking, presenting, authoring, writing about my space and, and building your brand, I guess is what it is. And I, I feel like I, I feel like I'm talking about two different things, but they are tied together, becoming a little bit famous, building your brand as it relates to developing relationships. And I think that's really, really important is, is not just being a little bit good at a lot of things, but finding something and then doing a deep dive and becoming really, really good at it. I'm really good at developing relationships because I love people, which allows me then to present and write and collaborate and present to other people. So I guess that's what I would say. That's awesome. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. And Jules, I'll tell you really quick and then yeah. we'll wrap it up. But my first exposure to, to Sue Ann and Deb, I walk in, I'm late for a dinner with Atticus and here's these two women leaders running a full court of people around them. And like she said, because she loves people, they have everybody engaged. Everybody's engaged in this conversation. I'm like, who are these two ladies? They're running everything right now. I'm just meeting them for the first time. So I was intrigued because of the fact that your energy is so infectious, Sue Ann, and Deb's the same way. You're so open, right? And you're, you're generous from a business perspective. I mean, you share advice. You, you, you were great to be in a mastermind with because 
you could answer the most complex questions and you were always both so humble. So on that note, I'm just going to say thank you for, for our friendship, for everything that you've ever shared and for everything that you've done for me, our team, our rope team, the people that we've been in those rooms with. You're just very giving. And I think that that's part of your success formula is that you give without asking, you provide value upon value upon value. And you're just, you're just a great person to be around. So thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. We took an hour of your time. So thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you back so much. From the bottom of my heart, Tom and Julia, thank you. You've been fabulous to work with leading up to this. And I can't wait to get to know you. I know. I can't wait to continue this conversation. <laughs> if anybody wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? We'll put links to your website and stuff in the show notes, but how, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Is it LinkedIn? Is it your website? Like, what's the best way? Oh, probably email. And my email and my cell phone number is all over. I'm easy to find, Sue Ann Vandermeiden, but I respond to every email and text message. So go for it. Don't awesome. make Sue Ann. Go slower there. All right. You're the best. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm looking forward to seeing you next year. You're the best. And keep doing what you're doing. I'm watching. I'm watching you. Thank you. Back at you. (laughs) 